Hello and welcome to King Manor. As you can hear, King Manor today is located in a bustling commercial center, the heart of downtown Jamaica, Queens. But when Rufus King, anti-slavery founding father and framer of the Constitution, bought this house in the year 1805, it would have been surrounded by a working farm that he and his family expanded to nearly 200 acres. Let's go inside and learn more about the family who lived here. Although Rufus intended to retire from political life in 1806, he would actually spend the rest of his life in and out of politics and be devoted to causes like the anti-slavery cause. After Rufus King passed away, his oldest son, John Alsop, came to live in King Manor. John Alsop King was governor of New York State in the late 1850s, and as you can see, this Victorian-style parlor is much more densely and ornately furnished than the more scarce federal-era parlor we saw downstairs. As governor of New York State, John Alsop King made local laws to countermand the Unjust Fugitive Slave Act, so the King family continued their legacy of anti-slavery activism well through the 19th century. Rufus King's granddaughter, Cornelia King, was the last King family member to live in the house before it became a museum. When she passed away in 1896, the farmland had already been started to be sold off for other developments, including the Long Island Railroad. King Manor Museum opened as a museum in the year 1900. In the late 19th century, rapid industrialization meant older homes were being knocked down and replaced with tenements, flats, or factories. Social mores dictated that women should stay in the home, but this traditional home structure was being disrupted by urbanization. Women from privileged homes became involved in the establishment of local women's clubs and societies for social causes. Historic preservation societies were one of the organizations deemed acceptable for privileged women, as their goal was strongly linked to the home and the so-called women's sphere. The formation of women's clubs and societies can be seen as early steps towards women's equality in America. While upholding their traditional duty as a wife and mother, these club women were slowly taking steps to gain more freedom in the outside world. King Manor was opened to the public by a group of women 120 years ago who called themselves the King Manor Association of Long Island. These women felt that they were upholders of American tradition and had their sights set on becoming involved with civic activities while still remaining domestic. These preservation societies work to restore historically significant homes throughout the country, celebrating a quaint reimagining of what they saw as American heritage. Women in historic preservation were concerned with holding on to what they valued in American society, while that society was rapidly expanding with newly arriving immigrants who brought with them different backgrounds and cultures. The dining room in King Manor was used as a meeting space for the women's societies who helped preserve this museum. They used these bridge cards as one of their fundraisers as well as tea parties and luncheons. And at their meetings, they could call themselves to order by using gavels or bells. This particular bell in the King Manor archives features a racist character of a mammy with a little silver skirt. The fact that this bell was such a casual object with embedded racism shows the underlying currents of racial tension in American culture going on in the early 1900s, wherein people imagining the colonial period, white people that is, were interested in imagining a time period in which the recent gains for equality made by people of color were no longer present. When the 100th anniversary of the Revolutionary War came in 1876, America was in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. Many Americans were inspired by the rapid changes 
to reflect on the colonial period in an attempt to honor what they felt was their national heritage. The women of King Manor decorated the museum with a mix of furniture and decorative styles from nearly 200 years of history. Although not quote unquote period rooms as they are today, historically accurate recreations of the rooms to reflect the way Rufus King would have used them, the women of King Manor honored King Manor in the best way they knew how. As you can see, King Manor still has many of the objects that were in these very rooms over 100 years ago. Objects that the founding club women collected and donated to the museum can tell us about how people understood the past and what they wanted to say about it 120 years ago when King Manor opened to the public. These items, although seemingly common, symbolize the beginning of preservation efforts and were the King Manor Association's first steps to preserve Americans' colonial heritage in Jamaica. At the turn of the century, people believed that the objects with which they surrounded themselves had an impact on their psyche and their moral being. So it was natural, given the surge of patriotic fervor around the centennial in 1876, to decorate schools, offices, and even homes with portraits of national figures like George and Martha Washington. These were chromo lithographs done by a company called E.C. Middleton and endorsed by other famous people of the time like Orator Edward Everett. These lithographs were very popular for people who couldn't afford original oil paintings and they were based on the Gilbert Stewart portraits done of George and Martha during their lifetime. Here we have some special objects from the exhibit. These objects are really interesting because they were some of the earliest objects collected by the ladies of the King Manor Association. Let's talk about this saucer. It's not all of it says it is. Yeah, the saucer is definitely not as old as it seems. Here we have a porcelain saucer that was collected by the ladies of King Manor Association. Um, in the back there's actually a note that says it's from 1879 from Derbyshire, England, aged 200 years when actually the saucer would have only been from about 1830, making it about 40 years old at the time. Isn't that funny? They said that it was 200 years old when it was not even 100 years old. It, it, it just goes to show that the value of these historic objects was in their perceived heritage, not necessarily in what they actually were, which brings us to this box. Um, now the box also, like many of the early objects collected by the women, um, came with a note that said it was used by an officer who served with the Marquis de Lafayette. Um, we are all pretty familiar with the Marquis de Lafayette now because of the Hamilton musical, but um, you, were, were you aware of him a few years ago? Maybe not, but it just goes to show that he was one of the well-known popular figures amongst the George Washingtons and Thomas Jeffersons of the world at the early 20th century when this box was collected because his name had enough cachet that it made this box more historically interesting to the people at the time than perhaps it really is because there's no documentation as to who actually owned the box. Yeah. And then today we're a lot obviously more careful in museums with documentation and attribution, um, but these ladies, you know, had kind of a romanticized image of things from the 18th century and for them these objects kind of carried even more special meaning by being so old. A lot of times we have visitors who ask us how much the house is worth or how much X or Y object in the house is worth, and I think that idea of what is something worth from back then carries on to today because, okay, we can denominate how many square feet the house is and how many dollars per square foot the average property is in the neighborhood, but then you are not taking into account the historic factor that this was a founding father's home. So a lot of these things you really can't place a monetary value on, and at the time when they were collecting these, they weren't collecting them for their monetary value. Uh, the notes that accompany these objects and many others that have been in the collection since about 1900 uh, really show that what they cared about was this idea of heritage. Um, this object is really interesting because Let's, let's just assume that maybe it was used by an officer who served with Lafayette, but the inside has been furnished with things from a, a variety of different ages. So you can see here, um, they sort of kitted it out um, to complete the idea of a shaving kit, even though not everything in here would have been from the revolutionary period. Um, they, they needed to 
add some other things. So here we have a straight razor. I don't envy the gentleman who had to shave with that. And then my favorite thing, and I don't know that it's gonna show up too well on camera, but there's this um, very, very fragile fragment has its other piece of... Um, See the writing? Yeah, the yeah, there's a, actually writing on both sides. It says, use this soap on the outside, on the side that's facing me. I'll turn that around. And then on the other side, it says, read um, Plain Home Talk on the inside. Um, we did a lot of research to find that Plain Home Talk was a late 19th century journal. So this soap was actually advertising a magazine from around the 1870s. So obviously that had nothing to do with the Marquis de Lafayette, but um, whoever donated this object to the museum thought... Might have, maybe might have used the box themselves, <laughs> you know? I, don't, I mean, who knows? We, we, That's true. Sometimes we don't really know. Um, you know, we have a loose idea of the provenance of these objects, but over time, you know, objects change and their, their ownership changed. So the fact that, you know, this is actually from the time that the museum might have acquired this, you know, this might be used by one of these ladies. <laughs> you know, it does actually have a, a bit of wear to it that suggests maybe it was actually used as soap. Um, but I just think it's funny that they, they wanted to kit this out to look like a shaving box, mm -hmm. even though they weren't paying attention to what sort of objects would have actually been in it in the 18th century. They're like, oh, we use soap for shaving, so we gotta have soap in the box. And yeah, like you're saying, with the, the way objects change their life over time, you can actually see some of the wear and tear on the inside of this box. So, a cardinal sin in the modern museum world. But. <laughs> it's nice to know the, the, the lived history of these objects. Mm. And then you can actually see um, you know, some other modifications that people have done. And then you know, if you ever go to a museum and you see the numbers written on it, that's their way of cataloging the objects. Um, in 1900, they just put a big old sticker on it. And let's, let's show this one again because it also has a donor sticker. Yeah. So, let's see. I'm holding this up to the right spot. <laughs> yeah, it actually has, actually, if you don't mind, um, a lot of stickers on it, which are quite funny and tell the history of the institution. So it has the donor sticker with the um, little story about why they thought it was important to have in this museum, and then another name sticker with the donor on it, and then, turn it around this way, another sticker. Now, this sticker dates from the 1960s when there was actually an electrical fire here in the museum building, and we had to clear everything out to restore the building and the women worked really hard to fundraise to restore it. Practice almost exclusively by women. Morning picture embroidery was a popular pastime in homes throughout early America. King Manor's example is just one of the thousands of pictures produced in America during this patriotic period of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. On the surface, it was an art form to commemorate the dead and a way for women to preserve their family history. From Border perspective, the practice came to be an early symbolic rendering of the idea of Republican motherhood, promoting the traditional maternal duty of the female while also giving women a new civic role to perform. So here we have another example that we did not have room to put on display um, in the women's exhibit. Um, it carries a lot of the same tropes that many morning pictures of the period had. Yeah, you see the same iconography of the woman looking sad by the obelisk, and she's even holding, uh, it looks like a handkerchief in her hand, just like the other one, although it doesn't really look as uh, handkerchief-like. <laughs> you can see that these really um, exemplified the, the skill and the talents of the individual making the portraits. Yeah, and also, I mean, you think about the traits that it imbued for the maker. If you had a woman um, who would learn to make these from a very young age, they actually kind of took on this moral authority that, you know, they were doing their patriotic duty to the young America. Right. You can see that, not so much in the man's dress, but definitely in the woman's, that she's wearing that um, Grecian-style empire waist dress that echoes the Athenian democracy, that the architecture, um, not only of this probably cenotaph, but also, uh, you know, if you think about other buildings that were being built at the time, uh, even like King Manor, it's got those columns in front of it, just like 
ancient architecture that was inspiring these ideas of democracy. Yeah, and then, I mean, then you also have the natural background here. We have another example here, um, if you could zoom in. So they were always in a natural landscape, um, usually with a weeping willow tree. Here is an interesting example because this is actually made out of hair. The tree's actually made out of hair. Um, and these natural backgrounds also came to symbolize, you know, kind of religious connotations like the Garden of Eden. Right, I think people are pretty familiar with the idea of hair in mourning jewelry, but it was often chopped up and incorporated into these embroideries um, and that also include watercolor aspects as well. So another use of hair that's just not as well known today. When women created mourning pictures, they were preserving the history of their family for posterity, just like the women of the King Manor Association preserved this house for us to learn from and enjoy today. The story of King Manor's founding has large parallels on a societal level. The women who started the King Manor Association were able to do so because they had time and money. Even while historic preservation professionalized, it remained, and still does, an underpaid field because it was historically practiced by women who did it as a passion and didn't need the money because they had husbands to support them. While the Women of King Manor Association literally worked inside a home, their dedication and that of other early women historic preservationists helped bring women's activism to the social forefront, winning the right to vote, at least for some women, in 1920. One hundred years later, women's history is at the forefront of the national conversation. The hashtag MeToo movement and other contemporary women's rights movements are shedding light on the ways women have been treated and governed by society, sometimes as victims of unconscious bias, but often as targets of discrimination, much more so for minority women. Although women are no longer officially relegated to the domestic sphere in America, the legacy of the cult of domesticity remains in the pink collar jobs like nursing, elementary school teaching, and museum work. Thank you so much for coming on this presentation of King Manor and the Queens of King Manor exhibit, exploring the legacy of women in historic preservation. You can come see this exhibit for yourself until April 30th. Then come visit us again for a community curated exhibit with contemporary local artists. Make sure to check out our website at www.kingmanor.org for fun educational activities and upcoming festivities. We can't wait to have you as part of the King Manor family. Stay safe. <laughs>